Hey, Jeremy here, one of the pastors at The Way Church, and want to welcome you to today's sermon. Our heart for you and our prayer for you is that you're strengthened as you listen, and we always hope that in all the teaching, you would be pointed towards the person of Jesus. Good morning, everyone. Great to be with you. If we had met 12 years ago, if you and I had met 12 years ago when my family and I first moved here to Vancouver from Alabama, there is a pretty good chance that I would have invited you over to our house for dinner. Um, back in those days, I did not know anyone. Like, I had not one friend to my name. We were brand new here. And so I started inviting people, like almost literally anybody that I, I met, um, anybody who seemed even remotely interesting, I invited them over to our house for dinner. I really felt like I had nothing to lose at this point in my life. I remember, um, true story, meeting moms on the playground and just after a very <laughs> general conversation, do you want to come to our house for dinner? Um, another true story, I remember one time walking in a Safeway somewhere and seeing somebody walking towards me and we had a, kids approximately the same age and we were thinking, I think we could be best friends. And so I stopped and made conversation and invited her over to dinner. She said no. I just want you to know. Um, and yeah, I never saw her again. And listen, I'm not saying that this is the road to wisdom. It's probably, maybe it's not. But more often than not, those kind of invitations happened on Sundays for our family. So what we would do is um, Sundays before church, I would make some sort of lunch. And it was like a uh, like maybe a big pot of soup or or something that was cheap and easy to feed a crowd. And um, so then we would go to church and we would just invite whoever we met that day, people who looked like we could be friends with them. And so we'd invite them to our house for dinner. And generally people would say yes. And this was my working theory during that time. My working theory was that the best and easiest way uh, to get to know somebody was over a meal. I think it's weird to say to somebody like, I think we could be best friends. It's less weird to say to somebody, hey, y'all want to come for lunch? You want to come for, for dinner? And I think that meals can be a little bit magical like that. Inviting people to or, or being the one invited to a meal, I think, is one of the most inclusive things in the world. Now, today we're looking at uh, Mark chapter 2. We just read the story, and I, I love the story because it starts with, with two men who, who are just meeting each other for the first time, and Jesus is one of them, and it ends with both of them at a dinner table. And I think that this story has all kinds of implications for us today. So in our time together, we're going to very simply move through the story that we've just read in Mark 2. So if you like roadmaps, here it is. We're going to look at, first of all, the call of Levi. Then we're going to look at the response of the Pharisees, the response the Pharisees had to Levi. And then we're going to look at the illustration that Jesus uses. Okay, that's the roadmap. So let's pick up in verses 13 and 14 again. It says this. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. Okay, so the first thing that happens in this story is the call of Levi. Now, if you've been with us in this series over the last several weeks, you'll know that Jesus has already been doing this. He's already been calling and inviting people to follow him. A few weeks ago, we looked at Mark chapter one, and we saw a scene that was very, very similar to this. It was Jesus on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and he called his very first four followers. That was uh, Simon and Andrew, James, and John. Simon, Andrew, James, and John. And these guys were fishermen, and if you remember um, during that uh, day that we studied that particular text, we learned that when Jesus called these fishermen, it would have been a very surprising move on his part because usually rabbis at that time only called the very best and brightest students, the ones who would one day become rabbis themselves. But Jesus didn't do that. He just called ordinary, everyday fishermen. And it was beautiful. If you weren't here for that, I encourage you to go back and listen to that message. It was, it was awesome. And now I didn't preach it. Chris preached it, okay? So I can say it. Um, 
And now our text today tells us that Jesus is once again out beside the very same lake. But this time, he goes for a walk, and he sees a man named Levi sitting there. And he says to Levi, follow me. Now, here's why this would have also been another surprising invitation from Jesus. Because Levi, who is also known by the name of Matthew, Levi was a Jewish tax collector. And tax collectors at this time were responsible for collecting taxes on behalf of Rome. And Rome was an enemy of the Jewish people. And so then for us to kind of understand the story, we need to know that tax collectors in Jesus' day were, were Jews collecting money from their fellow Jews on behalf of an occupying foreign enemy. And it's maybe hard to describe the kind of resentment that the average Jewish person would have had towards a tax collector, but I want to try to help us uh, wrap our minds around this. So let me give us an illustration. This is a true story. It's told by R.C. Sproul. He, um, he's no longer uh, living, but he is a pastor and a theologian, and he tells this story. About 20 years after the end of World War II, he was doing some studying in the Netherlands, and he was renting an apartment there. And one day he was, he was walking home to his apartment, and he saw an older lady carrying some groceries, and she lived in the neighborhood, and he said hello, and her face just lit up. She got very excited, and so he offered to help her with her groceries, and then they struck up a conversation, and she just seemed so excited he was talking to her that he just kind of lingered for a good five minutes. Five minutes is a long time when it's a stranger, so they talked for five minutes, and then he excused himself and went inside of his rented apartment, and as soon as he got inside, his landlady was standing there, and she was livid. And she said to him, I saw you talking to that woman out on the street. How could you talk to her? How could you offer to help her? And of course, he was like taken taken by surprise and he couldn't understand his landlady's hostility until she told him that this woman he'd met on the street had been a collaborator with the Nazis during World War II. And during World War II, she had sold out some of her very own countrymen, had betrayed them, including this landlady's son. This woman that he'd met on the street and had a great conversation with, she had been a traitor to her own people during World War II. She was hated by her neighbors in the neighborhood that she lived in. I tell that story because I think that landlord felt about that woman the way many Jewish tax collectors, many Jewish people would have felt about the Jewish tax collectors. Like the Jewish people of Jesus' day simply could not understand why their own countrymen would help and collaborate with an enemy that was oppressing their own people. And as if that wasn't bad enough, the tax collectors at this time would often grossly overcharge the people, their own friends and neighbors, in order for them to get rich. So then tax collectors were not only viewed as, as traitors to their own country, to their own people, they were also viewed as cheats. One scholar tells us this about tax collectors. He says, the Jewish writings known as the Mishnah and the Talmud set them beside, set them, that's tax collectors, beside thieves and murderers. They were expelled and banned from the synagogue. The touch of a tax collector rendered a house unclean. Yet, yet, amazingly, Jesus calls Levi, a tax collector, to follow him. And I've been thinking about that this week because I think that this is even more unexpected, even more scandalous, even more offensive than when he called those four fishermen. Because those four men, those four fishermen may not have been the brightest boys in school, but at least they were decent. You know, like at least they had hard, um, honest working jobs. At least they had taken on the family trade. At least they hadn't forsaken their their country and their friends and their, their neighbors and their family. Maybe we could wrap our minds around Jesus inviting them to follow him. But a tax collector, the worst of the worst, one who knowingly willingly cheats his neighbors and family, one who would collaborate with the enemy just for the sake of, of money, it's hard to wrap our minds around. It was certainly hard for the people of that day to wrap their minds around, and yet Jesus looks at him and says, Levi, follow me. And I wonder how Levi felt in this moment. 
that's another thing I've been kind of sitting in this week as I've been studying. Like, what was going through Levi's mind when Jesus Christ, the Son of God, walks up to him and says, Levi, follow me. I wonder if in the the days or weeks or months leading up to this moment that we've just read about, if Levi had heard the rumblings, if he'd heard the rumors around town about this man named Jesus, about this rabbi who pursued the most unlikely of students, about this rabbi who called the unqualified ones, the unworthy ones, about this man who was preaching the forgiveness of sins and then he was healing and delivering and now crowds of people were following. And I wonder if Levi sat at his booth, despised and alone, getting richer but somehow emptier, and if there was a point at which, as he heard all of these things about Jesus, his heart just began to like burn in his chest, and if hope started to well up from somewhere deep inside of him, and if he began to wonder, could it be? Is this for everybody? Does it apply to me too? Does this message of hope and forgiveness matter for me too, or am I too far gone? Like, did I already find the line and cross over it? Can I even be saved anymore? Or maybe his question is, was, am I even worth saving anymore? And along comes Jesus, along the shore, sees him, looks him dead in the eye, not with the anger of, of a mad dad, not with the hatred of a cheated neighbor or the hatred of a hurt friend, but with the love of a savior. And he invites him in, includes him in. As I was preparing this week, I just felt so strongly that maybe, maybe there are some of you that have felt a very similar burning in your chest. That as you've sat and you've heard the stories and you've listened and you've heard this, the, the news about Jesus, you've heard the good news, and, and it's not that you don't believe it, it's just that you wonder if any of it really does apply to you too, or if you're just too far gone, that maybe you have just messed up way too much, that you feel like you did find that line and that you're just flat out past the point of no return. And I wanna promise you this, from one very broken sinner to another, I want to say to you that you are not too far gone. And I can promise you this, as one who is, I'm speaking from my own um, personal experience in this now, that as one who was stuck in so much sin and so much darkness that I could not see straight, I could not save my own life, as one who thought I was just way too damaged, way too damaged to be of any value or any use to be included in anything that God would do, I can tell you not only based on the beautiful words of scripture, and they are beautiful, but because I've lived the thing, I know it to be true for myself that my God has the power to deliver us, to deliver you from whatever prison you might feel stuck in, to deliver you from whatever lies you've told yourself, what others have told you, what the enemy has spoken over you. And I just want to speak the actual truth over you and tell you that you're not too far gone in case you've been wondering, that you have not messed up too much, that there is not a line at which you point and Jesus, at which you cross and Jesus goes, well, now you've done it, no more. He is willing and he is able to come after you. And because of Jesus, whatever your past is, it doesn't define your future. One of the wildest things he does, and honestly, I still can't wrap my mind around this, is how he, he seems to take very great delight in making something just like ridiculously beautiful out of our mess. I don't know why, I don't know how, but he does it. I was at um, the Freedom Sessions graduation on, on Thursday night, and I got to hear story after story of exactly this. I mean, this is not just my story. This is so many of our stories where we have experienced Jesus Christ reaching in and delivering us from something that we thought we were stuck in for the rest of our lives, that we weren't even sure we were worth getting out of. We, we weren't even sure if we were worth getting rescued from. But here comes Jesus, and he does it. He does it. And we've never gotten over it, never gotten over him. For some of you, maybe today is your day. Maybe today is the day that you can 
respond to Jesus as he invites you to follow him. And he never forces us to do this, by the way. Like, Jesus doesn't ever force us to follow him. We always have a choice in the thing. But in case some of us need to hear it today, we're invited, you are invited by Jesus Christ. So, Jesus calls Levi the tax collector, and Levi says, essentially, yes. I bet he did. I bet he did. Verse 14 tells us that Levi got up, he left his booth, and he followed Jesus. Levi, once the sinner, the traitor, the cheat, the thief, now Levi, the follower, the disciple of the living God. Wild. The story doesn't stop there. We get to see what happens next. Levi essentially throws uh, a dinner party, and we see this in verse 15. It says, while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law who were Pharisees saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? So not only does Levi follow Jesus, but he invites him over for dinner and has his dinner party. And we see like he invites all of his friends and now knowing what we know about tax collectors, you might have guessed that basically his friends were his coworkers. They're, they're other tax collectors, fellow, fellow sinners. And there's Jesus at this, at this dinner and he's at the center of it all. And the Pharisees are mad about it. And that's the second thing we're gonna look at today the response of the Pharisees. The Pharisees have got a real problem with the people Jesus is eating with. Why? Why are they so angry? Well, one reason is found right in their name. The word, the the Greek word Pharisee, it means separate ones. That's literally what it means, separate. To quote uh, R.C. Sproul, the theologian again, he says, the Pharisees believed in salvation by segregation. Salvation by segregation. In other words, if you wanted to be saved, you had to separate yourself from the outcasts. You had to separate yourself from the sinners and the tax collectors because if you just like got too close to them, then you would become like them and you yourself would become contaminated. So the Pharisees, by practice, separated themselves from anybody that they deemed unclean or unworthy or unholy. And so for the Pharisees, it bothered them to see Jesus not doing his part, not staying a safe distance, but actually getting close and getting right in there with them. They were bothered by that, but the fact that he was doing something as personal as sharing a meal with them, that was like next level for the Pharisees. Because meal times were incredibly important in this culture. One scholar says this, he says, it would be difficult to overestimate the importance of table fellowship for the cultures of the ancient Mediterranean basin in the first century of our era. Being welcome at a table for the purpose of eating with another person had become a ceremony richly symbolic of friendship, intimacy, and unity. And when persons were estranged, a meal invitation opened the way to reconciliation. I think if we fast forward to our culture today, not much has changed. Like, meals are one of the things that that still unite us, still tend to unite us. Like think about whenever you, just in your own life, when you meet somebody or or you want to get together with another person or another couple or another uh, group of friends, the idea is almost always, I think, pitched out as, let's go for dinner. Or do you want to come for dinner? Or let's go for coffee. Like somehow food is involved. It's almost never, do you just want to go sit on a bench and look at one another in the eyes and stare into one another's souls and talk? Like that's not, it could be a little awkward, There is something about throwing food into the mix. It makes it much less awkward. I I, I have um, a girlfriend that I ran into. I hadn't seen her in a few years, and she has a lot of food intolerances. Is is that how you say intolerances? Yep. Okay. Let's go with it. Um, And she said, uh, I was like, let's, I did the meal thing. Let's get together. And she was like, let's just let's just not do food. And I was like, well, then what would we do? <laughs> like, is there anything else? Like, what, are we going to go on a hike? <laughs> Come on. Anyways. Um, but 
You throw food into the mix and it's a little less awkward. And this isn't a church thing, by the way. Like, this is a people thing. Research is increasingly showing us the importance of communal meals. The University of Oxford did some research on this and they published its findings in a paper entitled, and I love the name of this article. The name of the paper is Breaking Bread, The Functions of Social Eating. Isn't that a great name? University of Oxford. And the results of the study show that communal eating increases social bonding and feelings of well-being and enhances one's sense of contentedness and embedding within the community, whether it's a feast or a snack. The mood elevation we get from eating with people is ancient, based in our primal human nature to sit around a fire pit, share food, and tell stories to make sense of our lives. I cannot tell you how many times I've sat around a table eating food, and we're, all we're trying to do is just make sense of our lives. It's just like, what is happening right now? Now, okay, so it's showing us communal meal, like research is showing us communal meals are great for us. We see it in scripture. Now, a lot of us might think to ourselves, or maybe you're hearing, you're thinking this, like that sounds good in theory, but as I think back to this week, this week, and I remember some meals I had, they did not sound anything like this. Like my roommates left a disaster in the kitchen. I did not feel my well-being increased at all. My husband worked late again, and then we got into a fight, and we were trying to eat over all of it, and I didn't feel my sense of contentment enhanced at all. Or, if you're a parent in the room, you know where I'm going with this. Um, you might say that hardly any of your communal meals ever feel like a particularly like transcendent experience. Maybe nothing about it feels particularly peaceful. Maybe the kids complained you had to send one of them to their room for bad table manners, or maybe the conversation felt more like you were having to be a referee. And to be honest, the meal wasn't even that good anyways. Like, it was a total Pinterest fail. Um, it didn't feel like much was happening in the way of intimacy or unity or reconciliation. The table just felt like a table, and the meal just felt like a meal. It didn't feel like anything particularly special was happening, and yet, and yet, I think Jesus shows, that the, shows us that there's actually something deeper happening around a table when we're willing to show up and enter into community with other people. It's striking how much of Jesus' life is described in the Gospels as being spent around dinner tables, at meals. And I think because it's mentioned so often, it's something worth paying attention to. Like mealtime seemed to be one of Jesus' very favorite places to do ministry. <laughs> awesome. Well, any of us can do that, probably. Eugene Peterson, he says this. He says, a primary, maybe the primary venue for evangelism in Jesus' life was the meal. And it's not just that Jesus is eating, which I love. It's who he's eating with. Because Jesus gets this reputation for eating and drinking with the most unexpected of people. And that's exactly what's happening here in Mark 2. And again, the Pharisees could not handle it. They thought holiness meant separation. But Jesus shows them that holiness is not separation from people. It's actually sanctification by being with people. In other words, holiness is born, bred, and matured, and lived out in the context of community. Listen, like, I always feel holy when I'm by myself. Like, anybody else? Like, I always just feel like I'm doing pretty good. It's when I'm around other people that humility comes into play. It's when I enter into life with other people that I learn, oh, man, maybe I'm not as mature as I was. I still have, or as I thought I was. I still have a ways to go. Like, I'm still being sanctified. And part of the way that Jesus embodies the reality that the kingdom is built on community is by sitting at a table with candles and crusty bread and a glass of wine, and he enters into ordinary life and conversation with people. Let's dare not think that all he did the whole time was just talk about the scriptures. You know he asked people how their day was, how their kids were. How's work going? Do you like it? Ordinary conversation with ordinary people. I think Jesus was so curious about others. But the Pharisees aren't having it. They are not having it because they think that transformation should precede invitation. 
In other words, if you want the invite, you'd better change first. If you want a seat at the table, then you'd better shape up, you'd better get in line first, and then, and then maybe then you can get an invite to the party. But what Jesus is doing is the complete opposite. He is showing us that invitation precedes transformation. And this is such good news for us because it means that we're invited to the table exactly as we are, that you're invited to God's table exactly as you are. Like you can pull up a seat before you believe, before you behave. You can pull up a seat while you've still got questions. And this is a great picture of what we do in Alpha, by the way. This is kind of what Alpha does. Pull up a chair. You are welcome here. Come with your doubts and your questions and and your mess if you've got it. Jesus welcomes all of us, and he's not threatened by any of it. Now, the Pharisees are sitting there thinking that this means that if Jesus is just here welcoming everybody, then he must not care about sin or about our behavior, which is not true. It's not true. We have to read the rest of the Gospels to know the full story. Jesus cares about how we live. And he does invite all of us to follow him, and he invites us into a radical life change. Just read the Sermon on the Mount, and you'll know it in Matthew's, uh, Matthew chapter 5 to 7. Saying yes to Jesus, choosing to follow him, will eventually lead to radical life change in every area of our lives. It leads to change in areas of our, our relationships and, and, and our money and our sexuality and the way that we think and the way that we talk and the way we treat other people. But that life change only happens if we first trust that we are deeply loved by God in the brokenness and the mess. And so he invites everybody, everybody to his table for a meal. Jesus' table always preaches a, ma- a radical message of inclusion, of God's inclusion, which means, I think, which means that if God invites you and I to his table, then part of our response as his followers is to invite others in, to invite others in to taste and see that he is good. And one of the easiest places to do this is over a meal, even when it's inconvenient, and it usually always is, even when it takes time, and of course, it always does. But we keep doing it. We keep gathering around tables with family and friends, and we keep bringing our broken selves, just as we are, to Wednesday night dinners and Saturday morning breakfasts and Tuesday afternoon lunches. We, we keep pulling up our chairs to our kitchen tables and our kitchen islands. Or if you don't have any of those, you just have a couch. So you just kind of have a tray on. You pull up wherever, you, wherever you've got it with your other people. And you keep on breaking bread and making conversation and laughing and maybe sometimes crying. And yes, maybe sometimes we're refereeing and maybe sometimes we're disagreeing. And it isn't always going to look or sound or feel perfect. But we keep doing our best to live our lives in close proximity to one another, understanding that to live in close proximity to another human being inherently means that you will eventually bear witness to their brokenness, but also they will eventually bear witness to your brokenness, to mine. It's the beautiful and the hardest part of community. And we do this, though, because this is the Jesus way to keep on entering in, to not stay far off, but to enter in with others. And again, over a meal is a great place to start. Okay, last part of the story. The Pharisees are mad, Jesus knows it, and he hears them uh, rumbling and complaining to some of the other dinner guests, which is so awkward, right? Like, it's just awkward to hear somebody complaining about what's going on while you're at a dinner party. Um, And that leads us to the third movement in this story, and it's the illustration of Jesus. It's in verse 17. On hearing this, Jesus said to them, "Is it it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So this was a well-known proverb in that day. It would have been familiar to them. But what Jesus is saying here is, I am the doctor. 
I'm the doctor and I have come for those who are sick in their soul. I've come for those who feel far from God. I've come for those who know they are sick and for those who think they're well. He's come for the unrighteous and the self-righteous. Now, here's an interesting thing that I think the story shows us, is, and I've, I've referenced it earlier, but it's that we don't have to come to Jesus. Like, we don't have to come to his table. It's optional. He'll never force us, but we are invited. And the Pharisees' response here to Jesus shows us that, that it's possible to refuse an invitation, and I think the response shows us at least two ways that we could refuse an invitation to sit at Jesus' table. The first way is by being very bad and refusing to admit our need. In other words, like, I'm sick, but I don't want and I don't need your help. The second way is by being very good and thinking you don't have a need. Like, I'm not sick at all. It's a form of denial. The shocking thing I think about this story is the reality, like, that that the quote-unquote bad guys, like Levi, the tax collector, they can have a seat at the table, and that the quote-unquote good guys, the Pharisees, sometimes choose to refuse one. But everybody's welcome. We're all welcome. All we need to bring is our need. And to be clear for Jesus, it's not about good and bad. It's not. For him, it's about, will you let me heal you? Will you let me enter in with you? Levi did. Levi said yes, but the Pharisees said no. They didn't. And you and I have the same choice. Jesus says, I have come for those sick with sin. There's an illustration that we've used here at The Way before. You might have heard it. And it's one that we take very seriously. And we, we say this, that there is a big difference between a church that feels like a waiting room full of patients that are hopeful to see a doctor and a church that feels like a bunch of people who are applying for a job. There's a difference. So in a job interview, people are dressed for success, right? There's pressure to perform. There's pressure to put your best foot forward. You always want to highlight your strengths and minimize your weaknesses or even just completely hide your weaknesses if you can. The waiting room for a job is filled with competitors, not with fellow patients. We see them as people to beat, not people who also have needs that need to be met. And this kind of environment is an enemy to authenticity, to vulnerability, to humility. And since all of those things are required, they're necessary for deep relationship, like authenticity, vulnerability, humility, these things are necessary to have deep relationships with other people to really enter into community. And since all of those things are required for relationship and community, that kind of environment, uh, the, the waiting room to, for a job kind of environment, that's an enemy to authenticity, to vulnerability to humility, but a room filled with patients waiting for a doctor is different. Everybody there is sick, in different ways, of course, but everyone's sick. Nobody's there pretending that they're not sick. They're just patients with other patients waiting for the doctor. There's no room for pride, no room for one-upmanship. Nobody is pretending that they just don't need help. And that kind of environment leads to openness, vulnerability, and humility. And the gospel creates that second type of environment, the hospital-like environment. And that is the kind of church that we wanna be here at The Way. It's the kind of church that we aim to be because the reality is that we are all sick and in need of a doctor. And God has come to rescue us in and through Jesus, if we would let him. If you were here last week, you might have heard Jason say at the end of his message that, that Jesus loves, that uh, the message that Jesus comes with, that Jesus loves and forgives us, is so much better than, hey, you're, you're fine just the way you are. I understand why we would say that to other people, 
why we would say you're fine the way you are. It's because we, we wanna affirm what's, what's good and precious and beautiful about other people. We don't wanna talk about sin because, because we're worried that it's gonna somehow produce shame in another person. I think that's fair to say, and I get that. And, and it can produce something like toxic shame. Shame because of who you are, or shame due to things that you just can't control, or shame due to what's been done to you. Toxic shame is the kind of thing that minimizes your value as an image bearer of God. Toxic shame is the kind of thing that turns the worst thing about you into the only thing about you. But then there's also such a thing as healthy shame. And that kind of shame is a catalyst for change. That kind of shame comes as a result of bad behavior. Like if I cheat on my husband, I ought to feel ashamed. If I gossip about my friends, I ought to feel ashamed. Sin should produce shame. And here's the good news. Whether it's toxic shame or the healthy, appropriate kind of shame, the gospel declares over all of us, shame off of you. But the thing is, is that it's only good news for us. It's only good news if we're willing to admit that there was ever shame on us in the first place. To say shame off you or to say your sins are forgiven is better than, you know what, you're just fine the way you are. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Because if you were to say to me, Alita, you're fine the way you are, what happens then? later this afternoon or tonight or tomorrow when I come face to face with my flaws and my failures, with my, my anger, with my impatience, I know the truth about me. I know it. And in those moments of painful honesty, I know I'm not fine. I'm not all right. I know that there is a sickness in my soul and that I am in desperate need of a doctor, of the, the doctor. Friends, we're not fine, but we are loved. We're not fine, but we can be forgiven. We are not well, but God can heal us. None of us have earned a seat at his table, but he invites us anyway, just like he did with Levi. And listen, his love for us is based on a prior knowledge of the very worst things about us. He already knows. That thing that you have kept under lock and key, he knows it. And he still loves you, still wants you, all of you. And so he pulls up a chair and he leans in close. And he invites us in. That is the story that Jesus' table has always been telling, both then and now. Daryl's gonna come and lead us in communion in just a moment, where we're literally gonna get to come together as a community, if you would like to, to the table. But before we do that, let me just pray for us. Jesus, thank you that you invite us in, that you see the very worst things about us, know it all, and you still want us, still love us, still invite us to have a seat at your table. Not one of us has earned it, but I pray today we would hear your voice inviting us in with the love of a good father, the love of a savior. And for those of us who remember being delivered from the depths and the darkness, I pray that it would fall fresh on us again. How good you are, how beautiful you are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks for taking time to listen to today's message. 
If you're interested in learning more about The Way Church or if you want to get connected in any way, you can go to our website, thewaychurch.ca, and we would love to hear from you. Again, our prayer was that you were strengthened through today's teaching. Trust that you were, and much love from our team to you.